Uh, hi, Tim. You see Irvine, and he will speak about uh, history and philosophy of uh, fluids and mechanics. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Nader, for the invitation. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here uh, for a week with Professor Masmoudi and his team. It's, I really enjoyed it. In the talk uh, a few days ago, uh, we we discussed uh, some of our recent results on developing a minimization principle for navier stokes Today is a, is a bit different. It's uh, I've been interested in the history and the philosophy of science over the past several years, and I have a few lectures on the topic. Uh, the first lecture was on history of mechanics from Aristotle to Einstein and uh, history of the principle of least action, which I'm going to mention today, I'm going to discuss today. History of fluids from Archimedes to Stokes and history of aerodynamics. And the one that is uh, probably uh, dear to my heart is the history of the theory of lift. Uh, under this fancy title, a mathematical war in the background of the Great War, summarizing this uh, very rich uh, book. It's a 550 pages book uh, written uh, from the eyes of a sociologist who talks about the evolution of the theory, uh, relates it to interesting uh, underlying incidents in, 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 in society of World War I, politics and press. So uh, if you're interested in history, all these lectures are recorded online and posted online. Uh, today will be just a hodgepodge of uh, pieces from here and there. I hope it will not be too incoherent. I'll uh, start from uh, the peak of the Renaissance, the uh, formation of classical mechanics. And as you know, uh, dynamics is a science that uh, relates cause to effect. The cause, we would call it a force, and the effect is the motion, of course. And the point is, the way you quantify your motion will dictate uh, a certain definition of the force upon you. So and here, the, I mean, to define your motion, to quantify your motion, the dynamics of the time, the geometers of the time were divided, actually. There is the Newtonian way, and the, I would say the, the Cartesian way, because Newton was uh, following Descartes, and there is Leibniz and his followers. So, for example, we all know that uh, Newton quantified the motion. He defined his quantity of motion by linear moment. And uh, this means that his force will be, he defined the force to be the change in linear moment. That, that's what we know. And uh, this is, you know, so this is his dynamics, uh, which is basically the second law in his principia. The alteration of the quantity of motion is proportional to the motive force. Leibniz uh, was not, uh, did not like MV as a quantity of motion. He actually proposed a different quantity called it vis viva, the living force, which is MV squared. It's, it's just our kinetic energy. So to him, uh, the force is the change in the kinetic energy, change in the quantity of motion. And actually this, uh, so, so because the Newtonian way is the way that uh, dominated afterwards, so his force is our force. Uh, Leibniz forces is different. If I want to write the way that uh, Leibniz used to do dynamics in our own language today, it will be work is the change in kinetic energy. So to him, you know, his force is our work kind of thing. And this came in a, in a paper by Leibniz, uh, a short demonstration of a famous error of Descartes. He was, uh, you know, opposing Descartes concerning the claimed natural law according to which God always preserves the same quantity of motion. So he's criticizing the, the concept of conservation of linear momentum in our language. Uh, he, he's saying that MV is not conserved all the time, so it should not be uh, a good measure of uh, motion. So anyway, th this, this division lasted for a long time, for 30 years in the community. At that time, the, uh, I would say it's between Leibniz and the Cartesian followers of Descartes, among, among whom was Newton. So the academicians, they decided to make a competition. Hey, folks, please settle this debate for us and tell us how to do dynamics. And uh, I'll tell you the, their arguments. So their argument was as follows. We already know from the time of Galileo and Huygens that if you let a particle slide along an inclined plane, it will acquire during this excursion amount of force that is enough to take it back up the hill to the same elevation, right? So that we, we already know that. So this means that the force uh, is proportional to the mass. The heavier the body, the larger the force, and uh, it goes by elevation. The larger the elevation, the larger the force acquired during the excursion. So the, the, the Cartesian force is, is something like MH kind of thing, okay? 
But if this is the case, then it cannot be identified as change of MV. That was the argument by the Leibniz followers. Why? Because uh, if the force is identified by MH, this means that the two scenarios must be equivalent. A particle of 4M sliding from an elevation H should be equivalent to a particle of mass M uh, sliding from uh, an elevation 4H. So it should, during the excursion, it should acquire the same amount of force. But we know that the end velocity, the end MV during the end of the excursion, they are not the same, right? Because, because the first particle for M is the mass and the velocity goes by square root H. They already know that. So these two quantities are not, are not the same. So uh, I'm giving the same force and giving different results if I quantify my motion as MV. That was their, their argument. So uh, people here in this branch was McLaurin, Sterling, Clark, Mazier, Abbé de Catalan, and uh, Domega. Here was uh, Bernoulli, Wolf, Herman, Coyne. You can see from the names, it's like a group of French scientists versus a group of German and Swiss uh, mathematicians. And you encounter this throughout the history of science. So actually, Abbé here uh, responded that yes, this this particle will require will you know acquire double the effect, double the energy, but in double the time. So it, it doesn't mean it's it's double the force. It actually means the same force. So that was one response to their argument. Here is another argument about elastic collision. If you do elastic collision before collision and after collision, and you measure MV, in fact, if you talk about V literally, like the speed, then it's not summation MV is not constant. Whereas we know that summation MV squared was constant. So this was one of the arguments of Leibniz follower. And uh, during, during the course of this discussion and this debate, Domega realized that actually we should treat V here uh, with a sign. So going this direction is opposite to going in that direction. So can you imagine, this is about 40 years after the Principia and the community did not realize yet that MV is a vector quantity that need, we need to take sign into account. Uh, so anyway, uh, so after they, they, they figured out this sign thing, now summation MV with the vectorial thing is, is conserved. So that was a response. But then they retorted back, the, the French folks, they retorted, they said, okay, what about inelastic collision? In an inelastic collision where the, both particles move with the same velocity after collision, uh, and this velocity is unknown, we want to determine it. Then we know that summation MV is constant, but summation MV squared is not constant. So to this argument, uh, I mean, the Leibniz followers could not respond. And uh, this argument, among the others, uh, it made the debate settled to the Cartesians. And this is why it's the dominant uh, definition of the way doing mechanics. Their force is our force. And, and here I'd like to recall to Cathy. Uh, he said, the question which has been encountered by every scientist and philosopher throughout the entire history of civilization, what is force? It's a non-trivial question to ask, actually. Uh, what is force? And luckily, general relativity got us away from this. Like, there is no force according to general relativity. So, OK, uh, I'm done with this. Uh, I'll move on to the principle of least action. And then, uh, I will try to give you a motivation uh, for Feynman. So uh, this was written in Feynman's lectures in physics. So he was giving, after getting Nobel Prize, giving a, a lecture at Caltech in, in, in the famous uh, Feynman lectures on physics. He recalled uh, an incident that happened to him at high school. Uh, so at high school, Feynman uh, was already, you know, he already finished everything, physics, math, chemistry, blah, blah. So he was sitting bored in classes. So uh, his teacher, his high school teacher, Mr. Bader, Feynman respected him so much and uh, used to tell many stories about him. He found him bored, so he, uh, he wanted to show him something exciting. So he called him, Richard, come, I will show you something interesting. So fast forward, Feynman got Nobel Prize. Feynman is giving a lecture at Caltech about the principle of least action. Now he is recalling that incident. Richard, come, I'll show you something interesting. And he said, then he told me, his teacher, about something which I found absolutely fascinating and have since then always found fascinating. Every time the subject comes up, I work on it. In fact, when I began to prepare this lecture, I found myself making more analyses on the thing. And instead of worrying about the lecture, I got involved in a new problem. Let me get my pointer here. So uh, 
the thing, oops, there's a point. It doesn't work anyway. The thing that uh, Mr. Beta told Feynman about was the principle of research. So, uh, so Feynman kept his excitement about the principle of least action until from high school until he did the PhD, where he did his PhD on the application of principle of least action to quantum mechanics. Then it continued even until this lecture after getting the Nobel Prize, as he is saying. So the principle of least action, uh, I mean, in my opinion, it goes back to Mbukhtui, a French philosopher, mathematician, among other things. And uh, I will uh, start like many people do by Fermat. I mean, uh, tracing the history of the principle of least action, I will start, many people will start at Fermat, I, 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 I will also do here. So uh, we know the refraction of light, right, between two mediums. And uh, so Fermat was a mathematician. So he asked the following question. I have P and Q fixed. So the point O in the middle, I'm going to vary this point O, and uh, at any particular O, it dictates a certain relation between theta 1 and theta 2. So he said, if uh, a ray of light tries to minimize time between P and Q, when I arrive between P and Q with the shortest time, this will dictate certain O, and will dictate this relation between the two thetas, which is the famous Snell law, which was actually uh, derived earlier by Descartes, but using an incorrect assumption. He, Descartes assumed that the speed of light increases with the density of the medium, which is incorrect. Here, uh, Fermat is recovering this famous law from a minimization perspective. So it's one of the earliest trials in the written history, at least, to relate a phenomenon in, in, in physics to minimization maximization. And then uh, for just a you know, historical record, here is Leibniz where he introduced the vis viva concept, the kinetic energy, because it's very relevant to the principle of least action, as you're going to say. Newton's Principia, then Bernoulli's uh, Brax-to-Chrome problem, which is also very relevant to the principle of least action. As you guys know, this is the Brax-to-Chrome problem, which he posed as a challenge to his contemporaries, including Newton and others. So uh, if I let a particle slide on a generic curve from A to B under the action of gravity, what is the shape, the optimal shape that will uh, force the particle to go in minimum time. So this triggered, as you guys know, a, a whole branch of calculus of variations. Now we can do calculus with respect to shapes and curves instead of just you know, uh, real variables. Uh, then this is the academy competition, the Academy of Science that we talked about, and Euler's book on mechanics, just for the historical record. Here is the first paper that is very relevant to the principle of least action, Mubuktui. He studied equilibrium of particles, okay? Each mass M under the force F and all these forces, he assumed that they go by the distance to the end. So he proved the following theorem. He said, uh, if all the forces go by distance to the power N, then equilibrium will happen such that the following quantity is maximum or minimum. The first derivative is zero. What is this quantity? Well, it's uh, something that goes to, by distance to the power N plus one. If force goes to by uh, r to the n, what quantity goes by r to the n plus one? This is the integral of the force with respect to the distance. So it's like work or potential energy kind of thing. So this is really the genesis of the principle of minimum potential energy. But anyway, so here you can see clearly that uh, his mind is thinking, relating uh, mechanics, equilibrium, like the masses, forces, and equilibrium, to minimization, maximization. His, his mind is thinking this way now. And he made it clear in the very next paper to the Academy of Science, where he drew an analogy between light and motion. So light rays in the same medium, they move along straight lines. Also free particles, they move along straight lines. And as you know, straight lines minimize distance. But then when he went to refraction, we already know from Fermat that refraction seen that the light ray minimizes time. So he pondered why distance here and time there. There must be a more fundamental quantity that nature minimizes in every single motion and this quantity reduces to distance here and reduces to time there. So he started to uh, you know, ponder upon this. He's saying nature is optimal. There must be a quantity uh, that nature minimizes in every single motion and this quantity should be the action needed to execute the motion. And he started to think, how can I express it mathematically? So he said, okay, if, if I have a particle 
and uh, this particle will be moving. And I want to minimize the action needed to execute the motion. The heavier the particle, the larger the action. So the action should go by the mass. The larger the velocity, the larger the action. So it should also be proportional to velocity. And the larger the distance, the larger the action that needs to execute the excursion. So he defined the action to be MVS, just like this without mathematical proof, without experiment, just a thought experiment. And interestingly, he recovered almost all the laws and the results at the time from this fact, minimizing the action. Whenever he finds unknowns, he differentiates his action with respect to unknown, yeah. equate to zero and get equations to find the unknown. That's it. So in fact, in, the, in, a, in another paper to the Royal Academy of Berlin, he considered uh, this problem, the inelastic collision, right? And he, uh, so in the inelastic collision, after collision, the, both particles, they move with the same speed and this speed is unknown, okay? So fine, he form his action, summation of actions of each particle, and we have one unknown V, differentiate your action with respect to V equal to zero, you get the exact same V, that we know nowadays, and they knew back then by conservation of linear momentum. And that's uh, that's actually a nice exercise that you can test your uh, students upon. So, so why, why, why you are putting the square? Uh, that's a very good thing. So because uh, that's a very good thing, actually, because here uh, we, we will come back to it. But let me S, you can expand it the distance for a for a unit time. You can expand it as V times one. So it becomes MV squared. Yeah, that's a good observation. So he managed to recover all the results and the laws at the time from minimizing the action. The community fought back so hard. Actually, uh, in this paper, he wrote the following. Uh, After so many great men have worked on this matter, I hardly dare say that I have discovered the principle on which all the laws of motion are founded. You can imagine how satisfying this was for, for him while writing these words. The, the community fought back so hard uh, because uh, this is not rational mechanics. This is, uh, they accuse them, oh, you, you're a man of final causes. You're putting yourself in the shoes of the God. You're sitting there and thinking, uh, 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 you know, uh, about the wisdom of the creator. I mean, mechanic, we, we don't do it. We don't do it like this. I mean, actually it took them like 2000 years to liberate dynamics from the Aristotelian authority. Aristotle was a man of final causes. You know, he used to do this all the time. So after, you know, Galileo time frame kind of thing, after two years of Aristotle, uh, they liberate mechanics to become a rational science. We do mathematical derivations or we do experiment to infer facts from ex experiment. This is, this is how we do dynamics. We cannot just sit there and ponder upon how the universe works. So they fought so hard, he, he endured scathing criticism from famous people of the time, D'Alembert, Voltaire, even Lagrange, many, many people. At the beginning, they accused him that uh, they, they, they rejected the principle and they said it's, of course, incorrect. But then they found that the principle applies to almost all cases at the time. Then they said, oh, you, you stole it from Leibniz. So actually, if you look here, the action uh, here, if you expand GS like I was talking to Nader now, uh, if you expand GS by VDT, then uh, the action integral is nothing but the integral of this Riemann. Right, the kinetic energy. So uh, uh, a colleague of Mugurtui, who graduated from the Royal Academy of Berlin, Koenig, he actually showed a part of a letter from Leibniz, alluding to the fact that nature seemed to be minimizing this weaver. And the polemic was so tense to the fact, to the extent that the king ordered the search for that letter, but they didn't find the letter. Uh, actually, there was a very interesting paper at the time, the same year, 1744, by Euler. Uh, in Appendix 2 of this paper, Euler proved rigorously, as usual, mathematically, that the trajectory of a projectile, if I just draw this, this trajectory, Y as a function of X, it extremizes this integral, the action integral. So if there were one man who can uh, you know, claim the honor of the principle of this action would have been Euler, but actually... He, he defended Mabuktui. He said, no, 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 that was a very special case, two-dimensional and uh, just a projectile. On the other hand, Mabuktui was proposing it as a general principle of mechanics. And actually, he, he respected Mabuktui so much, he said he, he used to describe him as our illustrious president. He was 
elected the president of the Royal Academy of Berlin. And when he, when he was elected the president, Koenig returned his diploma to the academy. It was a very tense fight in the community, which was uh, settled later on when Lagrange proved mathematically rigorously that in the very general case, not just a projectile, indeed, the motion are, are such that the action integral is extremum, subject to conservation of mass, all right? So it's only for conservative system. But for this general case, yes, the action integral, the first derivative of the action integral is zero. That was the rigorous proof, but it's not necessarily minimum, maybe minimum, maybe maximum. So while it gave a, a mathematical stamp on the principle of least action, it detracts a little bit from its beauty because it's, it's no longer minimum, you know? And then, as you know, Hamilton's added his piece, uh, did it in the time domain, and also allowed for time varying velocity dependent potential. So it can handle a special class of non-conservative systems. So, and actually, this is the way that is written in the contemporary textbooks. This is why some people say it's Hamilton's principle of least action, but indeed it's book of tweet. So enough for the principle of least action. Now I'll uh, I'll shift uh, gears a little bit and discuss this point, which uh, I, I don't think I discussed it in my previous lecture the following way. Uh, so it's about sociology of fluid mechanics and the role of viscosity and uh, demonstrating this on, on the fluid force problem. By the fluid force, I mean uh, the force acting on a solid biofluid, which we encounter in every single day and night. Airplanes, submarines, ships, you know, cars, dams, there is always some fluid acting on a on a solid by force, and we want to determine this force. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I don't know where to start, but I will start with Newton. Uh, he developed two theories actually on this subject. This, I, I'll, I'll just skip the first theory because uh, the second theory corrected the first. Actually, both were incorrect anyway. But uh, the second theory, uh, he said that uh, if you have fluid particles are, are you know continuous chain, that the fluid motion is a continuous chain of particles. And unlike the first theory, he said for the second theory, when, a, when one part of the fluid moves, this motion gradually communicates to the rest of the fluid. Because in the, in the first theory, he said the fluid particles are independent. Now he's saying if a fluid particle is moving, it cannot move. Uh, you know, it has to, to actually, he called it defectus lubricitatis, which is lack of slipperness. If a fluid particle is moving, it cannot slip you know, above the, the layer below it or below the layer above it. So he's alluding to viscosity kind of thing. Either this flow particle, it will get shear to the neighboring flow particles, okay? So using this theory, he actually uh, computed in Proposition 34 in Principia, he computed the resistance on a solid cylinder and sphere. Of course, he did not write this expression. They did not use to write it. This is our today language, right? They did not used to write this. It's interesting if you go and read how they write things. You can, you can see it in the lecture online, the full version of the lectures online. Newton stopped here, uh, but if you use his theory to uh, answer, you know, to determine the force on, on a flat plate, which is very relevant to aeronautics. Uh, so a flat plate is moving at an angle of attack. According to the Newtonian theory, the fluid particles will move in straight lines uh, until they hit they impinge the flat plates, so they lose their momentum normal to the plate, you know, generating the force. Then you can easily derive this force, which is uh, the famous sine square law. Newton never written it himself, but uh, you can derive it from Newton theory. Now let's look at this and compare it to what we have nowadays. This is the lift coefficient versus angle of attack. The red one is the Newtonian theory, this theory. And the black one is the current theory that we teach all over the world in aeronautical engineering schools. And you can see, so nature was much more generous in providing lift than what Newton has anticipated. In fact, if this formula were to be true, aviation wouldn't be feasible. Uh, in fact, some people even blame Newton for delaying aviation because the very small lift and very large drag associated with his theory seem to have, uh, you know, push people away from aviation, like discourage people from pursuing aviation because it's not feasible according to this theory. But anyway, uh, so you can see that, that this is very far, what Newton did was very far from reality when it comes to force that the fluid acts on a, on a solid. 
and not only him, many of his contemporaries. They, they, if you go and read the literature back then, it's, it's like a morass. Everyone is coming with an experimental result, someone else coming or the theoretical result. Nothing matches the other. It's so, so when this happens, then the the the, the academy, uh, you know, make a competition. So the Royal Academy of Berlin, they made a competition on the resistance of fluids. Hey, folks, we, you need to sit down and tell us how to compute this force from the fluid in a solid in a systematic way. And uh, they stipulated that uh, the winner must provide both uh, theoretical investigations and experimental investigations, which is very difficult. So actually, no one won that award. <laughs> Even we're talking about the best minds in the you know modern history. That's the peak of the Renaissance. Okay, Dunbar participated and didn't like this decision that because he 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 thought he actually said that uh, you know the theory is too difficult to allow one to divide his attention between theory and experiment. But anyway, he collected what he did for the competition <clears throat> and published it in a later paper and try to compute the force on some shapes. And whenever he does this, he finds a completely symmetric solution for up, up and down, resulting in a zero net force. And he wrote his famous uh, paragraph, I must therefore confess that I do not know how the resistance of fluids can be explained by the theory in a satisfactory way. On the contrary, it seems to me that this theory, handed with all possible rigor, yields a resistance which is absolutely nothing in at least several situations. I bequeath this strange paradox to the geometers that they may explain it. This is the Dallenberg paradox. So also, so even after Dallenberg, they're still, uh, I mean, we, we didn't get anything. And then again, uh, then uh, 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 came Euler, uh, where he came up with the concept of continuum, so fluid elements so we, where we can use differential calculus. And actually, Lagrange has a nice comment. He said, Euler did not contribute to fluid mechanics, but created it, is indeed the case. He wrote two very important papers to the uh, Academy of Berlin, I guess. Uh, one on the equilibrium fluids, just static fluid, you know, there is no motion, where he recovered the equations for equilibrium that were derived earlier by Leroux and D'Alembert. But then he did the, the dynamic one. Uh, and uh, in this dynamic one, it was, if you go and read it, it's quite generic. It's actually compressible, non-homogeneous. It's, it's very generic, by the way. Not only very generic, it's, uh, it's actually uh, super clear. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, you can see it, it's, re it's, re it's replicated in Dugas' book, René Dugas, History of Mechanics. You can go and read it. When I did that, it's, it, it's as if you're reading a contemporary textbook. It's exactly the way we teach fluid mechanics nowadays. It's the fluid element P, P plus DP, you know, writing down Newton's equation and ignore higher order terms. It's exactly as if you're reading a contemporary textbook. And this clarity was described expressively by René Dugas saying that so perfect is this paper that not a line has aged. Yeah, that's the exact same way we, we teach fluid mechanics nowadays. 300 years after the equation of motion. And actually, Lagrange uh, made also this nice comment. By the discovery of Euler, the whole mechanics of fluids was reduced to a matter of analysis alone. Unfortunately, they are so difficult that up to the present, it has only been possible to succeed in very special cases, which when I read this, I, I smile because that's the exact same situation nowadays. It's, it's diff very difficult. We can just uh, succeed in very few cases, perhaps the same few cases that they succeed in. This is again 300 years after the equation of motion. The Euler equation did not help much in uh, determining forces on objects. And this can be expressively stated by Ducati. He said, Euler was the creator of hydrodynamics, but the beautiful trousers he tailored had no buttons. They failed to include viscosity. So, and, and we know that Navier included viscosity. So this is Navier. Uh, he wrote uh, three very important papers to the Academie de Sciences. One on elasticity, one on equilibrium, hydrostatics, and one on dynamics. Uh, he actually didn't follow the way of Euler, like continuum mechanics, fluid elements and stuff. He did it a completely different way using uh, what he called molecular hypothesis, that the particles, they have uh, repulsive forces, the, the, the molecules, they have repulsive forces that depend on the relative distance. That was main hypothesis. 
no fluid element, no differential calculus. And uh, because uh, actually his way, you know, it went to oblivion. Nobody, nobody liked it. Nobody, you know, built upon it. So I think you will not be able to find it in textbooks of fluid mechanics. You can find it only in history. So this is why I'll, I'll give you a little bit, of, I'll touch upon his approach, just sketch. So he considered two fluid particles. Let me see if I can, uh, can do a pointer, I don't know. Laser pointer. For some reason, it doesn't work. Anyway, so we have uh, two fluid particles, one M and one M prime. And of course, the, the, the difference alpha, beta, and gamma are, uh, they vary in space. The relative distance are, and then if M is displaced by this virtual displacement, then M prime will be displaced by this. What really matters is the variation in the relative distance because it affects the forces, the repulsive forces. And then he computed what he called the moment of the mutual uh, work or actions. In our language, this is virtual work. So simply, you get the force multiplied by the virtual displacement in the direction of the force, that's the virtual work by definition. And integrate over all molecules to M prime to get the effect on M. When he does this, uh, through some very tedious mathematical manipulations I could not follow, but I, I can notice that he did uh, something like uh, integration over spherical coordinates, so it created this pi kind of thing. Now the remaining term is, uh, is integral over R only. And I personally will call this two term uh, for a reason I'll show you now. And now this is the, this is the work coming from the uh, repulsive forces, the virtual work. Now add to it, this is the principle of virtual work. The work coming from repulsive forces plus the work coming from the external forces, fx, fy, fz. This total virtual work must vanish at equilibrium. And then you do the usual trick, which is uh, integration by parts. You, you get these equations, which are the exact same equations of Kilero or Euler for equilibrium. So go to Euler, set the left-hand side to zero, anything that has motion. So you simply get the, the, the pressure forces balance external forces. So they are the exact same thing when you recognize this term as the pressure. So the pressure, our pressure to Navier was just a measure of the molecular force. Uh, so the interesting thing is that when he did this, he recovered the exact same equation for equilibrium, for equilibrium, he recovered the exact same equations. But when he did it in motion, he got extra terms to oil. Okay. So let's see when he did it in motion, he said, of course, there are new molecular forces, additional molecular forces due to the motion. And these ones, he assumed that they are proportional to the relative velocity between the molecules projected on the line between the velocities. Again, the same thing, uh, the, the, the virtual work, the force F bar proportional to V, so multiplied by V <coughs> times the virtual velocity now, so this is kind of power. And you, you know, same mathematical manipulations are very tedious, I, I couldn't quite get. Now he himself called this, term to epsilon now, okay? And then you do, you follow the same, you know, turn the same crank, principle of virtual work, assuming incompressibility. So you have this with you. You get, this is the equation in the X direction, for example, which is the exact same equation as Euler, but with an additional term. Now we can uh, identify this term as the viscous force, right? Epsilon is viscous. So Navier never mentioned friction in his paper. He never cared to, account for friction as we might think. No, no, he, he didn't want to account for friction or anything. He just started from a different perspective, molecular forces, and he naturally arrived at this effect. That's the interesting point. Uh, several years later, Poisson arrived at the same equations using the, you know, quant continuum mechanics like Euler. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, stress, pushy stress tensor and strain tensor, this language that we're speaking, continuum mechanics. And because this is clearer than the molecular hypothesis, he started to criticize, actually he criticized uh, Navier in the Annal in these two years. Uh, and, uh, you know, he started to claim priority to these equations. And Navier, here is one of Navier's responses. He's saying Poisson's equation, having come seven years too late, might be said to be of the same form as the equation that had appeared first, in order to rob me of the merit of having given the differential equations concerned, 
it would be necessary to show that my principles are contradictory in themselves or with the natural facts. It's not sufficient to say that the same equations have been found in another way to claim without proof that this way is better than mine, which is, you know, it, it makes sense, frankly speaking. Uh, anyway, Arago, the editor of the Annal, he settled the dispute to Navier. But like I said, uh, Navier's equation, the community at the time did not like this molecular hypothesis. They did not pick it up. So it actually went to oblivion. Nobody touched the, the equation for whatever, several years, many years actually. <laughs> they got resurrected after Stokes. This Stokes paper, and it's available online. You wanna uh, see it? As you can see from the beginning, even the title itself, it has internal friction. So his main objective was to account for friction. Okay. Uh, and uh, of course, when he got the equation, he acknowledged that uh, actually Poisson derived this equation before me. So he, this is what he's saying. I afterwards found that Poisson had written a memoir on the same subject. And on referring to it, I found that he had arrived at the same equations. The method which he employed was, however, so different from mine. So he, he acknowledged that Poisson had arrived at these equations before him. During, throughout the entire paper, if you go and look at it, he is comparing to Poisson. He is uh, recalling Poisson, citing Poisson, and he doesn't mention Navier except for this little footnote here. He said, the same equations have also been obtained by Navier in the case of an incompressible field. So actually this makes me wonder, I mean, we should at least name them Navier Poisson Stokes equation. Uh, and, and also it, it reminds me of, I don't know, there was a famous comment by Arnold, Vladimir Arnold, the famous mathematician, Russian mathematician. He called it a principle, he called it Arnold principle. If an ocean bears a personal name, then this name is not the name of the discoverer. <laughs> it's like Bernoulli's equation. It's not due to Bernoulli, it's due to Lagrange and so on. So actually, one of his students, Arnold, he said, the Arnold principle applies to itself. So it's <laughs> <laughs> the very next year, uh, Wazel published his uh, experimental, uh, you know, a report on his experimental measurements, the flow in a capillary tube. <laughs> And later, there were several people, including Helmholtz. They arrived at the Poisson law from the Navier's Stokes equation, which was, you know, that's the experimental stamp uh, to Navier's Stokes equation. And for the first time in the history of mechanics, we can determine the resistance of fluid in a systematic way from first principles. That's a, a big victory. Uh, I don't know, some people uh, say it's a big victory to the British school. Uh, and here I'd like to digress a little bit uh, to talk about this point of sociology of science. We, we have already seen in the beginning of the lecture the competition between the two, you know, the French against the Germans, right? And actually that, that paradox used to be called the Rikli paradox in Germany. And the Vier equations in France, even until relatively recently, like early 1900, they used to be Stokes equations, just the Stokes equations in England. And the condition used to be called Zhukovsky condition in Russia. And most projection is called, typically called Lire projection in France. And von Karman himself suggested that von Karman Street should be called Avenue de Henry Bernard in France. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that I think we need to admit that there is a component of sociology to science. And in my opinion, this component impacted the, the the mindset of the British community in fluid mechanics significantly, uh, you know, uh, pushing them to exaggerate the role of viscosity so much. And you, you can understand why. So every, everything before Stokes, we couldn't compute forces. Now after Stokes, we can compute forces with, with good accuracy. So, and the main contribution of Stokes was to add friction. So viscosity should be so important, right? So that, that's, in my opinion, that's their mindset. And in fact, they exaggerated the applicability of Nabil Stokes so much. So in fact, you can see here, this is Lamb in his book, 1910. It was, however, pointed out by Reynolds that the equations, meaning Stokes equations, have been put to a very severe test in the experiments of Poisson and others. And he is following. We can hardly hesitate to accept the equations as a complete statement of the laws of viscosity. That's like David Bloor was describing. This is an immense authority behind this statement. It's a, it's a, it's a, he's giving a, a stamp of truth to the equations. And frankly speaking, I don't know what severe test he's talking about. 
I mean, the experiment was that this is very small speed in very small dimensions. We're talking about very small Reynolds numbers, laminar flow. How on earth we could be really sure that Navier Stokes equation at that time is applicable to capture the dynamics of turbulent flows at high risk number? We cannot even solve Navier Stokes equation at high risk number in turbulent flows at that time. And the very first solution, perhaps one of the first, if not the first, solution of Navier Stokes equation at high risk number of turbulent flows was by Spalard in 1988. GNS, this is number around half a million. So, in my opinion, this definitely was an early claim of victory by Lamb and his uh, contemporary colleagues in the British community about the Stokes equations and its applicability to capture turbulent flow and everything. Complete statement of the laws of viscosity. That's uh, too much. So anyway, I, I think this impacted their way of thinking even when, when the problem of aviation came. So uh, 1903, the Wright brothers made the historic uh, record of first power flight. And uh, there were no guiding principles, no theory to explain even the simplest questions in aeronautics, how much a wing, how much a lift a wing can produce. So that to, you know, to determine whether the LPM will be able to carry its weight or not. That's the simplest question in aeronautics, right? So the, there was no theory to, to answer these questions. And this is why Manchester, he wrote a letter to Colonel Fullerton. He was the honorary secretary of the Aeronautical Society at the time. He said, I think it was a mistake of the Aeronautical Society giving the rights a medal for their contribution to aeronautical science. I agree with their having the medal, but it should have been for what they have done. Like he, he means they contributed nothing to aeronautical science, the Wright brothers. They were amazing engineers or whatever. I mean, they, they have amazing engineering ingenuity, of course, building capability, construction capability, fine, but they contributed nothing to aeronautical science. I mean, after they flew this, we don't know how lift is generated in a wing or, or anything or a formula or anything, you know? So uh, at that time, there was political tension in Europe. And of course, the emergence of this machine, uh, which may impact, uh, may have a significant impact on, a, on the results of an impending war. It caused, you know, caused some pressure on, on, on people back then. And, and this was exacerbated by some incidents, like, like here, for example. This is first cross-channel flight from France to England by Louis, uh, Louis Blériot. The very next day, the newspapers in England, they came, Britain is no longer an island. The nation's basic line of defense is breached. The channel is no longer a moat that makes the island impregnable fortress. It's, it was, it was uh, tense at the time. And actually, George Bryan, he, he, he was saying that the Germans are probably putting their best brains into improving their aeroplanes, which, which was the case, of course. Actually, Greenhill, in his 1914 Nature paper, it's available online also, he called it a mathematical war. So uh, right before, during, and after World War I, there was a parallel mathematical war between England and uh, Germany to develop two theories, one for the lift and one for stability of airplanes. In, in, in my two lectures on the subject, I focused on the lift and here also on, on the rest of the lecture. So there was two, computing, uh, two competing theories of lift, one in Germany and one in England, the one in Germany was purely a rotational flow, just potential flow, you know. Uh, the one in England, uh, it was inviscid, no viscosity, but they have some sheets of discontinuity. They call it discontinu discontinuity theory. So anyway, here are the results. This is the left coefficient, angle of attack. The red curve is the Newtonian theory we showed earlier. Blue curve is the British theory. Black curve is the German theory, which is the theory that we teach nowadays in every single aeronautical engineering school throughout the world, including England. So as you can see, they, they, got, it, they got it incorrect. But when they, when they got it incorrect, they did not try again, or they did not accept the German theory. It was available to them, by the way. They did not accept it. Their mindset was, no, 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 no. We cannot neglect viscosity. It's so important we cannot neglect viscosity. I'm gonna mention, you, I'm gonna mention here some, some statements. I'm sorry that I will keep reading. This is G.I. Taylor in his Adams Bryce essay. He's saying, in searching for an explanation of the forces which act on solids moving through fluids, it is useless to confine one's attention to a rotational motion. And uh, this is Cowley and Levy, one of the most authoritative 
books at the time in the English literature, they say the failure of the very strictness of the problem is due to the supposition that the fluid is perfect. They invoked a, a viscous theory, and this is their words, that will clarify at one stroke the whole problem of aerodynamics. Uh, Beristow was one of the strong opponents to the inviscid theory, the ideal flow theory. This is his book, Applied Aerodynamics. It appears to be fundamentally impossible to represent the motion of a real fluid accurately by any theory relating to an inviscid fluid. And here is as late as 1921. You know, 1921, the Germans had figured it all out. 2D, 3D, and bound layer. And even as late as 1921, this is right memorial lecture by Taylor. He's saying one must seek for the explanation of the forces that are observed in these cases in the action of the eddying region in the flow, which now you can understand it. So Taylor was interested in turbulence. So he is calling for a theory of turbulence. Beristow, 1923 Royal Aeronautical Society, as late as 1923, that, that's, that's done. Uh, he is criticizing parental lifting line theory that it did not mention a fundamental property of air on which its motion depends, viscosity. And he is saying Stokes equations were sufficient to account for the phenomenon, whether it was a steady flow or an eddying flow. These equations did not appear in the parental theory. And that's the main point to me. To the community back then, and I would say most people nowadays, they think if you did not st start by an abuse Stokes equation, your trial is not legitimate to begin with. That's it. Don't speak with me. That's that's the, the main point. And I, I I can you know list many many statements and evidences. Uh, so uh, here is a summary. And uh, if you're interested to know how we arrived at this summary, you can go to the lecture online. So the British idea of fluid is fiction, and I can uh, put it in the words of Melville Jones, one of the later professor of aeronautics at Cambridge. He actually said, this was regarded purely as an exercise for the amusement of students. It's material for examination, you know, for a prelim exam. It's not for serious research. Okay? The Germans, on the other hand, no, they believe that the ideal flow is a good approximation of the average flow at higher than some. Uh, to them, the very is the truth, right? A complete statement of the laws of viscosity. To the Germans, no, both ideal flow and Navier Stokes are idealizations. Lift is viscous. If you really need to get the lift, go and solve Navier Stokes equation. That was their attitude. For the Germans, no, ideal flow theory actually provides reasonable estimate of the lift. And in fact, uh, I mean, uh, the British community, because they, they found, I mean, the Germans are, are succeeding. And their theory is succeeding. So they put pressure on their scholars. Here is at the Royal Aeronautical Society, Major Law, one of the practical people. He said, I have no objection to providing scientists with endowments and facilities to allow them to pursue their strictly abstract studies. But who knows when, if ever, these studies will bear fruit. As an engineer, I do not intend to wait for them on this occasion. And he is absolutely right because we are 100 years after this you know, date, and we still cannot solve Navier-Stokes equation on an actual airplane. So the German uh, choice to, you know, accept that viscosity doesn't have a significant impact was a very smart choice. So anyway, with all this pressure, the aerodynamic subcommittee of the, I don't know, the, what is the, the ACA is the, uh, whatever, it's like NASA in England. They demanded experimental investigation of parental theory. Okay, so they put it into severe testing. I mean, this is detailed in the lecture online if you're interested. Quantitatively, qualitatively, and finally the theory, the theory holds quite strongly. And they started to concede. Even G.I. Taylor himself in 1926 report, he's saying, in the experiment by Brian and Williams, they show that the flow around a certain model aerofoil placed in a wind tunnel is not very different from an irrotational flow of circulation. That's G.I. Taylor himself. And this episode of history actually uh, had a happy end. The happy end happened when uh, Prantil was uh, uh, invited to give the right memorial lecture and received the gold medal from the Royal Aeronautical Society. Prantil was very smart uh, that he, in the talk he gave, the right memorial talk, uh, he gave a talk and wrote a paper that discusses their concerns, the concerns of the British community about neglecting viscosity. This is the title of the talk, 
and the paper, the generation of vortices in fluids of small viscosity. And the paper is available online. You can go and read it. He concluded that no serious error will be made if in the case of flow behind sharp edges, viscosity is totally neglected. And like I said, the British community conceded, even Taylor sent a letter 1930 to Prantill saying something like, you really deserve a Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, this is for both the Prantill boundary theory and the lifting line theory. Berstow, one of the strong opponents to uh, the ideal flow theory in his later version of the book, he's saying, from consideration of all available experimental results, it may be concluded that the main effects can be reproduced by potential flow theory. So basically, they are conceding. And the, 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 the last thing that I'm going to mention in, the, in this talk, uh, actually by Beristow also, in his lecture, 21 Years Progress of Aerodynamic Science. He wrote this interesting paragraph. Aerodynamic theory is now rather like the physical theory of light. Physicists use the electron theory on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and the wave theory on alternate days. Both have uses, but the re reconciliation of the two ideas has not yet been achieved. So it is in aerodynamics. In our experimental work, we assume that viscosity is an essential property of air. However, the practically useful theory of Prandtl comes from considering air as a frictionless or inviscid fluid. So I, I really like his analogy between the particle wave duality of light and the inviscid viscous duality in, in aerodynamics. And uh, I think I have to stop here. I took too much time. Thank you. Okay, are there questions? Please. So you mentioned that before the war, uh, the British had the theory available, what, what was being done by the Germans, right? How, like, what uh, allowed Germans to give away their material? No, no, that, that, that's an excellent question. It, it wasn't exactly like I, no, some it is. In fact, the German theory started first in Britain by an engineer called Lanchester. But because he's not, most of these people, like Rayleigh, Lamb, Taylor, Beristow, all these, they were from Cambridge, they were Wranglers. There is a whole story about this. Wranglers, I mean, Cambridge was, you know, the elitism is so high in Cambridge. Back then, I'm, I'm, anyway, whatever, we don't want to piss off people. But back then, the elitism was so high in Cambridge. To the extent that when they, they, they used to do like the, our prelim exam here and there, this is like an exam called tripass. This tripass exam, which is the equivalent of our prelim, they rank students. The first ranked student, they call them wranglers. The name of the wranglers used to be published in the Times magazine. And they, you know, they, they get celebrity like treatment. So uh, imagine these wranglers, you know, top professors and, and wranglers coming from Cambridge. And there is just a mere, I'm sorry, but you know, for them, a mere engineer doesn't have a PhD or anything and uh, is coming with a theory of, of it. They discarded it. Germans took it. Actually, he visited Brantel all the way to Germany before the war, and he took it and, and, and built a book. In fact, in that lecture, in the in the in the right memorial lecture by Brantel, he added this, this point that you guys in Britain claim the priority of our theory to your men. It's you who neglected it. So it was it was interesting. More questions? Please, Muhammad. What is the challenge to work uh, That's a good question. But I think uh, one of the interesting things happening is is the actually there is a, a book called Chip War. That's very interesting. It's uh, there is a current war between China and America about the chips. So we that's agree with science. What? We agree with the science part. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the politics part. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's a race to, you know, to manufacture chips also. There is also another race, maybe on a smaller scale, on jet engines. Yeah, there are secrets behind how to build a successful one. Please. What did that? I'm sorry? Uh... I think at that time, it was very serious experimental efforts by Eiffel and his contemporary people. In fact, I, I mean, you will, you will see it in the, in the lecture, but uh, when the British community was, was failing, British scientists was failing to develop a theory of lift, then the practical I mean, the engineers could not wait any further. So they were criticizing, they say, 
ask Ifil about the resistance of some object, and he will tell you like this, whereas you guys will take forever to answer our simple question. So, but uh, they did not, they did not make a serious effort to take it to, to, to so there was a serious engineering effort in France, definitely. But I, I, I think there was not a serious academic effort parallel to that, in my opinion. So they were building airplanes and blah, blah, but there was no too much work or significant amount of work on the fundamentals of the theoretical part during that period. I guess during that time there were like secrets, but uh, especially because uh, like the theory were allowing to, to build airplanes. So how, how did that happen during that time? Like, friends were going... You know. That's a, it, this is exactly what you mentioned here. So around the time, where is we are? Around the time... Um, so this is 1914. The war is 1914. Uh, a little bit before, I would say, maybe 12-ish. Uh, until the war is... After the war is ended, like, maybe until 20 or something. During this, this period, yeah, the Germans, all the work of Pratt and his colleagues, it was secret. And that, that's actually very interesting because I, I always ask myself, uh, the issue is, when the issue is, Germany won the mathematical war, but England won the actual war. So after the war, they had the means to put their hands on the Germans' war. That's the point. So, yeah, so after the, uh, they were a systematic way of getting the reports, the secret reports that were produced during the war by the German folks. Uh, and this happened on a much more, actually, massive scale in World War II. Uh, there's a famous uh, uh, spying uh, project called the Paper paper Clip Project. That This project is a project that is responsible for getting the, the, the technical documents in Germany after World War II. So it happened also after World War One on, on a smaller scale. All documents by Pratt and his colleagues went to England. Did they go to US or the USA? And definitely, definitely. Now, there, was, the there was there was actually actually I think I'm not mistaken, it was uh, 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 General Douglas Hansek at NASA Ames at the time who had the idea of getting all these documents for the Germans, I guess. There was coordination between the American and British at the time. Please. So the two competing theories of this have uh, a measurable impact on the aircraft production of two uh, of the two companies. Because of course, German aircraft was essentially German bombers were more uh, yeah, that, that's, range, right? that's, that's the that's the question that was 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 bothering me. That's an excellent question, very interesting. And uh, in for a, over a short period, maybe it was during World War One and towards the end. Yes, there was superiority of German airplanes over British. But after that, so I was asking this: Does, does this point in time affect what happened in World War Two? I think no, because what well, I mentioned. I mean, between World War One and Two, the British had the, put their hands on the documents to Germany. That's the issue. Yeah. But, that, but I mean, it's something to mention, but there is also a difference between the scientists and the engineers. Yes. Right. So, yeah. This is a this is a, an excellent point, in fact, uh, because. The, the, the German attitude, and, and in my opinion, and also David Lord's opinion, this is what made them succeed. Uh, they were motivated, like they, they were not doing theories just for the sake of theories. They were really motivated by contemporary problems of the time. The British attitude was more, uh, more purely academic style, even, even around this political tension kind of thing. So they figured out early on, like this strong result, I think they got it like around 1909, very early. And they still published actually in this 1914 paper, like five years after, they still publish on this theory because it's interesting. 
so, uh, so, so, so yes, it's 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 the work of Prantin was academic, but it was very useful from engineering perspective. Yes. So the retention getting the wrong result was it due to a uh, lack of rigor or like because no, no. of treating just the nearest to the right? So no, actually this is I I talked about this in the lecture online. It's it's quite interesting. It's uh, actually an interesting answer. He's saying he's saying okay, <laughs> you have a physical phenomenon. We want to explain this physical phenomenon. So, so the first time, the first time, one of the few times in history of science, you you encounter this that there is a there is a physical phenomenon, and there is a group of engineers who want to want to understand, and also a group of physicists who want to understand. Uh, we have now planes fly. We see them fly. When we build, you get a wing, you you go run on the on, on the ground with a certain speed, you will find yourself flying. Okay, so this is a fact happening in front of our eyes, and we need to understand what is happening. Uh, so uh, let's just start saying something like this is like playing chess with nature. I mean, I. He's saying, uh, you know, a move that might seem to be wrong seem to turn out to be successful again. So exactly here, for example. So the British said, viscosity is an essential property of air. That's of course, right? The Germans neglected from the beginning. This might seem to be a wrong move. It's neglecting an essential property of air. But at the end of the day, that turns out to be the successful move. So you don't know. Their attitude as an academicians was correct. I mean, why should I ignore this topic? And David Broadway was giving a, a good point in this. He was saying something like uh, the sense of urgency that the engineer feels gives them sometimes freedom to accept assumptions that strict uh, physicists cannot accept. You know what I'm saying? But like including the viscosity at the end, like ends up giving you wrong results or no? No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. They, they couldn't solve it. They couldn't solve this theory is not this theory is not viscous theory. Is this is their only trial in viscid flow? But it, it, they didn't, you know, they didn't extend to doing it. Yeah. And until now we cannot solve the risk of natural effects. Well, the Oh yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Any other questions? Is that one on the one uh, that uh, that's on the two G level. This is a quick that you like uh, you know, yeah, you apply a what is it comparing to the DNS in the of the close of a close, yeah. Close in, in the special case of that, that's the point. So that the engineer will just handle this case. The British physicists, they wanted a general theory of force probability. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the German engineers, they wanted uh, a theory that works for small angle attack, attached to you know, these are the conditions that we have in aviation. So, let's focus on them and have a, uh, an approximate theory for them. So, this is two dimensional attached to small angle attack. It's close, to close enough to reality. Thank you. Thank you.